Welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott. I'm a midlife millionaire coach and a certified financial planner, and I search the world for smart women and a few good men, including best-selling authors and thought leaders who are on that leading edge. So join us for conversations on money, business, health, and inspiration, so you can live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Smart Women Talk. This is your host, Katana Abbott, and I want to welcome you to the show today. I am so excited to be interviewing um, an expert in gluten and food sensitivities. His name is Dr. Tom O'Brien, and he's also an expert in autoimmune diseases. So we're going to be talking about the five pillars in the development of chronic um, inflammatory disease, the role of genetic vulnerabilities and environmental triggers that are going on, and also the triggers and mechanisms that create auto, the autoimmune cascade that eventually manifests an autoimmune disease. Now that sounds like a mouthful, but I'll tell you what, this is a major, major problem that's going on in the planet right now. Um, and just stay tuned because you're going to learn a lot and you're going to want to know more. So let me tell you about um, Dr. Tom O'Brien, because I am thrilled he's here. He's a recognized world expert on gluten and its impact on health. He's an internationally recognized and sought after speaker and workshop leader specializing in the complications of non-celiac gluten sensitivity, celiac disease, and the development of autoimmune diseases as they occur inside and outside the intestines for the past 40 years. He's also the author of The Autoimmune Fix, How to Stop the Hidden Autoimmune Damage That Keeps You Sick fat and tired before it turns into the disease. So with that, I want to welcome you to Smart Women Talk, Dr. O'Brien. It's so exciting to have you here. Thank you, Katana. As you, uh, as you uh, read the items that we're going to talk about, if I were a lay person, I'd go, oh my God, turn that off. I'm going somewhere else. Like what? Makes no sense. No, the five pillars. I mean, what? When you hear this, by the end of this hour, my goal is that it's an OMG for every, oh my God, I didn't know this. I didn't know, it's critically important. Wow, I'm so glad to know this. Wait till I tell my spouse or, so that's my goal in this next hour together. Yeah, I even had a hard time um, reading it and saying <laughs> it. I know, you know, it's, it, it's because I'm a geek. You know, I read studies all day, most days and, and uh, unfortunately, my language sometimes is a little too geeky, and my staff tries to translate it into something more every day. But this is most critical. I'll give you an example to begin with. The Nash National Institute of Health tells us that nine out of the 10 top causes of death in the US today are chronic inflammatory diseases. Nine out of 10. The only one that's not is accidental injuries. Everything else is a chronic inflammatory disease. That's what you're gonna die from. So, wait a minute. So if every, every kind of high blood pressure, Alzheimer's, diabetes, heart attacks, strokes, autoimmune diseases, if they're all chronic inflammatory diseases, does that mean that there's a similar mechanism going on creating inflammation for all of them? And the answer is yes. And when you understand this, now this is what they're teaching at Harvard Medical School right now. And we'll get into why it's at Harvard and not every medical school, but this is what they're teaching. And when you understand, if there's anything I can do to reduce the inflammation in my life, that's going to help reduce the likelihood of, you know, I've got that Alzheimer's gene and I hope, don't, I, hope I don't get Alzheimer's, but we'll talk about how all of that happens. But when you reduce the inflammation in your life, which is, and we'll talk about what that means, then your risk of developing the genetic disease that you're vulnerable to goes way, way down. I don't care if you have the Alzheimer's gene. It doesn't matter if you've got the breast cancer genes. What matters is if these genes get ramped up and they're very, very active. 
then you got a big problem. But if they're calmed down, you know, genes don't turn on and off. Genes up, and doctors have said that for you. Well, let's turn off the genes. They don't turn on and off. They operate on dimmer switches. And if you can dim down the genes of inflammation and turn up the genes of anti-inflammation, you're a healthy, vibrant person with no signs of disease. So that's, that's a million dollar concept that yeah, nobody so, so, so you're talking inflammation. So I want you to do two definitions for everyone listening, because my first time I heard about autoimmune was from Dr. Keisha Ewers, who cured her own rheumatoid arthritis with food. And I hope we talk about that. And also emo dealing with the emotions. So, and I didn't think anything of it because I didn't have it, but I did have it lurking inside of me. And just recently, when I, we talked about this before the show began, when I got my booster, it did a psychoteen storm and I, my autoimmune just went into hyperdrive. So now I realize I do have an autoimmune. So I want you to define for everyone listening so we know how important this is. Can you, um, what inflammation is an autoimmune? Is. Sure. So, sure. because it just sounds like something that, oh, it doesn't affect me, but it affects every one of us, I believe. Every person, every person. A couple of basic concepts. If you think of um, when you turn your car on and you, you're, you're going to drive somewhere, the car produces exhaust. Does it ever not produce exhaust if it's turned on? The answer is no. It always produces exhaust. Always. That's just part of the mechanism of how it runs. Your immune system is the armed forces in your body. It's the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. It's there to protect you. That's its primary job is to protect you. And it's working all the time because we're constantly exposed to things that are a threat for our bodies. And we, we never know because the immune system takes care of it. You know, you breathe in a little bug or something, or there's a little bug on the salad that you ate and uh, the immune system takes care of it. It kills the bug. You never know. But that's the job of the immune system to protect us from whatever is considered a threat. When the immune system gets activated to protect us, it's got exhaust. Anytime the immune system is active, it's producing exhaust. The exhaust is called inflammation. And we always have a little inflammation. It's normal. If you didn't have inflammation, you wouldn't be here. Inflammation is not bad for you. Excessive inflammation is bad for you. Excessive activation of the immune system is bad for you. You know, we don't ever want to shut down our immune system. They do that. Some experts do that with severe autoimmune diseases is they try to shut down the immune system. And those people never do. You never see a case study of someone who lives a vibrant, healthy life after they've been on the medications or chemotherapy to shut down their immune system. Maybe does, they're surviving. And does that include when someone has psoriasis and they go on one of these new drugs that shuts down the immune system to get rid of the psoriasis? That's because exactly you right. See so many commercials about that. And I even saw little tiny girls in their tutus and they were talking about the skin diseases and they can, you know, give them a medicine to make their skin nice again. And I'm like, oh my gosh, what about change their food? But go ahead. I, I just want to know, is that what you're talking about? Those kind of medicines too? Yes, exactly. Exactly right. Now, you know, there's nothing wrong with taking the pharmaceuticals that are prescribed to you to deal with symptoms you have right now. There's nothing wrong with that. But never are your symptoms a result of a deficiency of the pharmaceutical. So something else causes the symptoms. And the prescription puts a lid on the pressure cooker. Okay, so the skin gets a little bit better. It doesn't get perfect, but it gets a little bit better. Maybe, maybe not. Stop the medication, the thing's right back again. And then you read about all the side effects of the medications, and then you realize, boy, I'd really prefer not doing this if I don't have to. But we always tell patients, you know, listen, you got high blood pressure, you better take the medication. 
you don't want to mess around with that. But let's look at why you have high blood pressure. And I want you to contact the doctor that prescribed your medication to you and say, look, I'm going to change my diet. I'm going to do a little exercise and things. Would you monitor me? Because my doctor, my, this doctor thinks that I'm going to need less medication. And if I take the same doses, I know that I can get dizzy and, and pass out or something. So I don't want to overdose on the amount that I need right now. If I make my body stronger, can you monitor me, please? Can I come in once a month or once a week and your nurse like take my blood pressure or you know, do whatever you do, but just monitor my dosing? Because I really don't want to take this medication if I don't have to. But if I have to, I'm happy to take it, doc. Of course, I want to be safe. And every doctor is willing to do that. If they're not, find a new doctor. Right. But, you know, they should be willing to say, well, of course, as long as you come in and we're monitoring you, let's see what happens. You know, I don't know anything about this nutrition you're talking about, but as long as I'm monitoring you, let's make sure it's safe. That's a good doctor. That's a guy who says, you know, I don't know anything about this world, but let's make sure the world that I'm an expert in that you're safe. And that's the kind of specialist that you want. And when people start thinking like that, they realize the specialists they're seeing are not health specialists. They're hormone specialists or blood pressure specialists or skin dermatologists or neurologists, but they're not healthy neurology specialists, healthy skin specialists. Their job is to get the symptoms down and get rid of them if they can. That's what they're trained to do. And now, but when practitioners come to our courses at the Institute for Functional Medicine, they sit there and so many times, there is such gratitude in their faces. You know, we have a five day course. We've got them from seven in the morning till seven at night for five days. And they're just in awe. I said, this is why I went into medicine. Oh my God. And after 20 years of being stuck in the system with, uh, uh, the guidelines of Medicare or the local hospital guidelines or the local medical society guidelines. And then they come to us and we show them the science, this and this, science, 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 science. This makes sense. So what I want to talk with you about today is the science in everyday language of where these chronic inflammatory conditions come from. Okay. That's a deal. Let's learn. <laughs> So let's start with Professor Alessio Fasano, who is the chair of pediatric gastroenterology at Mass General at Harvard, a professor of medicine, Harvard Medical School, a professor of nutrition, Harvard School of Public Health, the director of the Mucosal Immunology Center at Harvard, that's the lining of your lungs, the lining of your gut, the lining of your brain, the director of the Celiac Research Center at Harvard. This guy has five titles. Any one is a lifelong goal for people at the top of their field. And he's got five. We think he's going to win the Nobel Prize. We truly do. Because it was him and his team in 1997 that identified the protein that causes this thing called leaky gut. And uh, They've been publishing on this now for over 25 years. And uh, so this concept of leaky And what gut, is the, the doctor's name? Fasano, F-A-S-A-N-O. Okay, great. And he published a paper. Now, someone like Professor Fasano is really careful of everything he says so that he's not misquoted. Every word he's really careful about. And he published a paper, him and his team, a little over a year ago, and listen to the title of the paper. All disease begins in the leaky gut. The role of the protein zonulin in the pathogenesis of chronic inflammatory diseases. And he talks about, now this is what they're teaching at Harvard Medical School. So the new guys and women coming out, they, I mean, they'll be on top of this, and it's much more detailed than what I'm telling you, but this is the 30,000-foot view without all the geeky detail. Professor Fasano talks about there are five pillars in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. Now, understand, when our time comes, we're going to die of a chronic inflammatory disease. 
And there's five pillars in the development of all of them. So if you understand these five pillars and you apply your attention and your efforts in the right area, you reduce the inflammation in your body. You reduce the development of chronic inflammatory diseases. So here's the five pillars. The first one is genetics. Can't do anything about the genes. That's the deck of cards you were dealt in this lifetime. But as I said, they operate on dimmer switches, not on off switches. The second pillar is environmental triggers. Now, environmental triggers are the fingers on the knob of the dimmer switches. So what you're exposed to is what turns on the genes higher or what dims down the genes. What you're exposed to in the environment and the most common environmental trigger is what's on the end of your fork. That's what's going in your body. But there's also the air you breathe. If you got mold in your house, you got big problems. Uh, there's what's already inside of us, the toxins that we're accumulating, the chemicals that have been stored in our bodies, the lead in the bones and things like that. Um, uh, and then there are the stress hormones that we produce inside our body. That also is environmental triggers that have their hands on the knob of your genes, ramping up your genes or calming down your genes. So that's number two is environmental triggers. Number three is many people have heard that 70% of the immune system is in your gut and that there's more cells of bacteria in our gut than all the cells in the human body. And that's true, uh, 10 times more cells. Number three is the microbiome, the environment of the gut. And that gets altered by the environmental triggers. And so you get too many bad guys, not enough good guys. And that creates an inflammation in your gut which then creates number four, the leaky gut. Now here's how you understand leaky gut. Mrs. Patient, your digestive system is a tube, starts at the mouth, goes to the other end, one big long tube winds around inside your gut, you know, your abdomen 20, 25 feet long, but it's one big long tube. If you could take a donut and stretch a donut out, so you got one big long donut, when you look down the center of the donut, that's your digestive tract. So when you swallow food, it's in the tube. It's not in the body yet. It's gotta be digested. That's what our enzymes do is break it down into smaller pieces, smaller pieces, smaller pieces, smaller pieces, until the pieces are so small, the inside of the tube is lined with cheesecloth. And nothing gets through the cheesecloth through the walls of the tube into the bloodstream until they're small enough. The cheesecloth is the screen. And so digestion breaks down, you know, you eat a hamburger, digestion breaks down the beef into smaller pieces, smaller pieces. Think of a pearl necklace, right? And uh, the pearl necklace, you have to cut it and then cut it again and cut and clumps of pearls, clumps of pearls, snip, 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 snip until you have each pearl of the pearl necklace, that's called an amino acid, that goes right through the cheesecloth into the bloodstream, and that your bloodstream is just a highway. You know, it's, uh, there's no lanes of traffic. Every, everything's going the same direction, but it's bouncing around in there, crashing into each other. But now you've got these pearls of the pearl necklace, these really tiny molecules of the beef protein in this example, they get through the cheesecloth, and now they're go, they go off and they're used to make new muscle cells. They're the raw material to make new bone cells, to make new brain cells. That's how our body works. It's a beautiful, beautiful system. But what happens when uh, pillar number three, the microbiome is too inflammatory, you get tears in the cheesecloth. That's the leaky gut. When you have the leaky gut, now bigger clumps of the pearl necklace called macromolecules get through into the bloodstream before 
they've been broken down small enough to go through the cheesecloth. They're not supposed to be able to get through, but there has now been a tear in the cheesecloth. So these bigger clumps of proteins get through into the bloodstream. And that's number four, the leaky gut. Now these macromolecules are in the bloodstream and now your immune, your brain says, whoa, what's this? That's not raw material to make new bone cells. Immune system, we got an invader here, fight this. Now your immune system gets activated to fight whatever these macromolecules are. That's the systemic inflammation that turns up the genes for whatever your genetic disease vulnerability is. Doesn't matter if it's Alzheimer's, breast cancer, diabetes, heart disease, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, MS, they all occur through this mechanism. So when you understand this mechanism, it doesn't matter if you've got rheumatoid or if you've got MS or you've got psoriasis or alopecia, you're losing your hair. It doesn't matter. The mechanism is the same. So you, you, you learn about the five pillars, not easy to do, will take you a good three to six months to really understand this and, and identify exactly what's specific for your body or your child's body. You know, if you have a child that's got a disease or uh, autism or attention deficit or whatever it should be, it's going to take a while to get this down. It's not so simple that what pill do I take to get rid of my psoriasis, right? That's never going to work. You can reduce the symptoms for a while, but you don't enhance the quality of life and extend quality of life. You don't do it by taking pharmaceuticals to put a lid on the pressure cooker. So Dr. Tom, I, um, I'm a really copious note taker. So I got to number four, leaky gut. And then number five, is that something to do with the inflammation? Number five is systemic inflammation. Okay. And then it goes right back. It goes back to, uh, um, uh, it, with number five, it goes right back that the inflammation activates the gene. The inflammation is, um, it has its hand on the knob of the gene, turning up the genes of inflammation for Alzheimer's or for breast cancer or for whatever your genetic vulnerability is. Now, there are some genes that if you've got the gene, you know, it's unfortunate and there's not much you can do, like cystic fibrosis. That's one of those types, but not breast cancer genes not Alzheimer's genes. I mean, it's not great to have them, but if you do, now you know what you have to monitor in your life to make sure that inflammatory response is not occurring, that those genes are quieted down. So I have a question then. Um, one of my um, clients told me um, that she had MS when she was young, when she was at Juilliard, and um, a fam in a family, a wealthy family sent her, I hope I get the story right, but um, a wealthy family sent her to a doctor in Switzerland. I don't know his name right now, but he, they have a whole different system at this place. It was kind of like a spa thing where they put her on gluten-free diet, dairy-free diet, certain supplements, all kinds of emotional. And like they had a psychologist talking with her, you know, social workers and massage. And, you know, this is Swiss medicine at its best. And when she came back, she continued the protocols. And she's 57 now. She does not have MS. And each time she keeps, I mean, it's still in her, but she doesn't have symptoms right. of the MS. Right. And so um, her neurologist said that um, now her brain scan has actually changed. And he still doesn't want to know what she's doing because he doesn't believe in it. <laughs> yeah, right. He doesn't believe in it. Right. <laughs> no, but her, but her um, specialist, her, her physician she goes to, he says, I do want to know about this now. He says, because the drugs I wanted you to take, a lot of those women are getting other diseases like cancer. Yeah. So she's, she said she would come on um, and, and talk about this on the show and tell it in her own voice. But what Marvelous. the Thanks. heck? happened yeah. there because she yeah that's uh, that that's likely the swiss mountain clinic 
uh, <laughs> where I'm, I'm a consultant for them. They're world wow. famous and they're just the very best people. We've been there many times. My wife and I go there and uh, it's just, if you, um, it, it doesn't matter what you've got. If you totally immerse yourself yeah, at Swiss Mountain Clinic and they have one week is okay, but they have two week, three week and longer programs. And you learn that changing your lifestyle creates a very different picture in your body. You, the goal is always to reduce the inflammation and Swiss Mountain Clinic does it so well. Well, she said she's going to come and tell her story. So um, I'm hoping we do that this month as well. So marvelous. what she said, though, about changing the diet with the gluten and the dairy, how important is changing our diet? Because when I heard you the first time on Margie Bissinger's Bone and Osteoporosis Summit, and you talked about this, I quit um, doing wheat that day. Yeah, I completely good. quit the gluten. I've cut way back on the cheese. And um, my psychotine storm thing for my COVID shot has come, you know, really, really cleared up, you know, um, my autoimmune. But this is the other thing I'm feeling is a total sense of clarity and confidence um, and energy that I've never had before. Yes, okay. yes. Yes. So uh, I don't know where that came from, but that's a side effect for me. So I want yeah, you to talk about the diet because I listened to what you said because I got very scared. Sure. You bet. You bet. Well, Swiss Mountain Clinic, they have a Michelin trained chef um, who's been there since they opened and uh, everything is organic. Um, it's possible to get some meat if you need it, but mostly it's vegetarian, but they're not fanatical about that, but it's available. But when we went there the first time, I had to sit down with them and educate them on the dangers of wheat. And the result was my wife spent a month with them and completely transformed the kitchen to everything is gluten-free. Everything there now is completely gluten-free, has been for the last four years. Uh, uh, so this thing about wheat, and it's not just gluten, it's wheat, and gluten is a protein in wheat. Um, uh, Professor Fasano tells us that the two most common triggers that cause the tears in the cheesecloth, this is what they're teaching at Harvard, the two most common triggers are the exhaust of bad bacteria in our gut called lipopolysaccharides or LPS, very, very common and very powerful to tear the cheesecloth. The two most common triggers are LPS and gluten. Of everything in the world that people are exposed to, LPS and gluten are the two most powerful triggers. Then Professor Maureen Leonard, also at Harvard, a very famous gastroenterologist, she did a literature review of 64, I think it was, maybe 67 different research papers on the topic of gluten and leaky gut. And she published this in the journal of the American Medical Association. And she said, previous studies have shown that gluten activates the leaky gut in all individuals who consume wheat. That means you, the listener, that you tear the cheesecloth every time you eat wheat. And now we have the videos from Harvard that show this occurs within five minutes of wheat coming out of the stomach into the first part of the intestine. The problem is that there are no nerve fibers down there to feel when you tear the cheesecloth. So people cross their arms and say, well, I'm fine. I feel fine when I eat pasta or I feel fine when I eat pizza. I don't feel a problem. And that's unfortunate. But for every one person that has a problem with wheat that gets gut symptoms, there are eight people that do not. They get brain symptoms like you did. Brain symptoms or joint symptoms or skin symptoms. The ratio is eight to one. So if you think that you have to feel it in your gut when you eat it for it to be a problem, you'll be correct one out of eight times. And you'll be wrong seven out of eight times. So just read the science. 
So, okay, I have a question. Then um, what about einkorn? And why is it um, that when people who have, you know, let's say gluten sensitivity or celiac type of things, they go to Europe and they eat their wheat over there, they don't get sick. Yeah, that's and- a really good question. Um, um, in the early 2000s, some doctors were writing that, well, the proteins are a little different in um, the uh, ancient grains. Mm-hmm. They're still wheat, but and they're quite similar, but there's a little bit of difference, so probably it's easier. But it was all theory. Uh, but now, as technology improved, they see that the antibodies that are made to wheat from the modern wheat that we all eat, those antibodies will recognize the proteins of the ancient wheat and you still get the inflammation. So once you've crossed the line of tolerance to where your immune system is fighting this aggressively, it's a simple blood test. Once you cross that line of tolerance, you can't have any wheat because it's gonna manifest, it's gonna ramp up the dimmer switch of your genes of vulnerability, wherever your genes of vulnerability are. That's why there's over 24,000 studies on wheat in the medical literature, wheat and skin symptoms, wheat and brain symptoms, wheat and schizophrenia, wheat and rheumatoid arthritis, wheat and MS, wheat and chronic fatigue, wheat and chronic immune deficiency study after so so many different conditions because it just depends on where your genetic vulnerability is that the inflammation caused by the tear in the cheesecloth getting into the max miles again bloodstream here comes the inflammation grabs onto your dimmer switches and ramps them up wherever your genetic vulnerability is now to your question about europe and european wheat that's true many many people experience that and they think they're fine the problem, then now we know the science came out 2014, I think it was, maybe 2015, so about six, seven, eight years ago, we learned that most of the symptoms that people get uh, from wheat are um, in their, um, outside the gut. Most of the symptoms are, and that's the proteins of wheat causing the inflammation that manifests wherever your genetic vulnerability is. But the gut symptoms don't come from the proteins of wheat, and it's not an immune response. The gut symptoms come from what are called the FODMAPs of wheat, the carbohydrates of wheat. And that causes the bloating and the gas and the sore stomach, the upset stomach, maybe the diarrhea or the constipation. The gut symptoms are mostly caused by the FODMAPs. The systemic symptoms are mostly caused by the proteins of wheat. Well, the wheat in Europe is lower in FODMAPs. So people who eat the wheat in the US and get gut symptoms they go to Europe and they're so happy they can eat the pasta or they can have the pizza because they don't have their gut symptoms anymore. So they think they're fine. Well, that goes back to if you think you have to feel it in your gut, you're, you're, you're going to be right one out of eight times. Because even though they don't get the gut symptoms, they still get the protein response, activating the immune system, activating the systemic inflammation turning up the dimmer switch of your genes for your collagen being inflamed, here comes more arthritic pain. Or for your brain fog, you know, because it activates the genes for your brain, blood flow into your brain, and here comes brain fog, or here comes depression. But your gut feels fine. But the next day, you're, why am I depressed? We're here in Italy, we're having such, why do I feel so low today? I I need to ramp it up. I'll I'll have a second cup of coffee. You know, we can't quite figure out why this stuff is happening. Bottom line, you can't eat the wheat anywhere in the world once your immune system is fighting wheat. Okay. What about the wheat and the oats in the United States, how they're sprayed with um, glyphosate? Glyphosate. Yes, glyphosate. Yeah. Why, why is that, that happening? And um, they, you know, have, don't allow that in a lot of European countries. So does that, that right. having part of the, you know, cause you've said environmental triggers. Right. 
And that's something that we haven't always had. That's correct. Uh, it was in the mid to late 90s that glyphosate came into the food supply. And you see that the increase in um, wheat problems, the increase in all autoimmune diseases has been going up exponentially, meaning faster than you than should be going up really quick since the 1950s. But wait, glyphosate didn't come until the mid 90s. Well, yeah, that's right. So glyphosate isn't the cause of the problem. Mm -hmm. Glyphosate contributes and makes the problem worse when you're eating these foods. So what's glyphosate? Glyphosate is they, they, they genetically modify the plants so they can grow in the fields and handle this toxic spray called glyphosate. Glyphosate kills bugs, insecticides, pesticides. You know, the, glyphosate kills bugs, so they spray it on the crops. And then when you get the wheat or you get the broccoli or you get the celery, it's got glyphosate on it. Minimal amounts, but it's got glyphosate and this stuff accumulates in your body and it does a nasty number on the bacteria in your gut called the microbiome. Remember that's number three in the development of chronic inflammatory disease is an inflamed microbiome. The geek term is dysbiosis. And that's your gut when there's too many bad guys, not enough good guys. So glyphosate is a problem, can't minimize it at all, but it's not the cause. It's, it's an additional trigger that may be increasing the, the, the speed of more people getting autoimmune diseases. It certainly may, but I don't think anyone's done that study because we've been seeing it's going up in the 60s and the 70s and the 80s and 90s. It's going up and up and up and up. And it's because of all the chemicals that we're exposed to in our world today. You know, um, you go to sleep at night and you pull the sheets over you and then you pull the blanket over you and they both have been soaked in flame retardant chemicals and you don't realize it, but you're inhaling minute amounts of flame retardant chemicals. Now, there's no evidence that the amount of flame retardant chemicals that you inhale one night of sleep underneath the sheet and blanket is toxic to humans. And that's correct, it's not. But then you put a little nail polish on and the nail polish is the phthalates, the plasticizers in the nail polish that make it hard. They're in your bloodstream in four to five minutes when you apply it on your nails. Now, there's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach into the bloodstream from applying nail polish is toxic to humans. That's true. That's how they get away with all of this, is that there's no evidence. But what they purposely avoided was to talk about how these things accumulate in your body. So give me a little girl who starting at five years old, paints her nails, her 10 little fingers and her 10 little toes and does it once a week until she's older, then does it more often. Now she's 20, 25 years old. She's been accumulating all of these chemicals in the body for years and years and years. And what's one result of that? This is such a jaw-dropping study that in Chicago, 2016, they took 346 pregnant women in the eighth month of pregnancy, and they collected urine samples, and they measured them for five phthalates, these plasticizer chemicals in the urine. And one of them was BPA. Many people have heard of this one, BPA. It's in water bottles and things. So they measured these five phthalates in the urine in these uh, eight-month pregnant women. They, ca they categorized the results into fourths, the lowest fourth, the next, the third, and the highest fourth. They then followed the offspring of these pregnancies for seven years. And when the children turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on them, the official IQ tests. There's not much in medicine that's all or every. This was every. Every child whose mother was in the highest category of phthalates and urine in pregnancy compared to the children whose mothers were in the lowest quartile of phthalates and urine in pregnancy, every child in the highest quartile, their IQ was seven points lower than the kids in the lowest one. Seven points. 6.7 to 7.4 points lower. 
doesn't mean anything to anyone until you recognize a one point difference in IQ is noticeable. A seven point difference in IQ is a difference between a child working really hard, getting straight A's, and a child working really hard, getting straight C's. Mm. This child doesn't have a chance in hell of ever doing Excel, Excel in schoolwork because their brain ne never developed properly in utero. Mm. Then just go to Google and type in phthalates, P-H-T-H-A-L-A-T-E-S, phthalates and neurogenesis, nerve growth. Here come the studies that show phthalates inhibit nerve growth. And mom, who painted her 10 little fingers and 10 little toes for 20 years and stores leftover food in plastic containers in the refrigerator, the phthalates leach into the food overnight. You eat the chicken the next day, it's got phthalates in it. Now, there's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of plastic containers is toxic to humans. In That's microwaving in the plastic. Exactly, exactly. That's how they get away with this crap. Yeah. And now here we are after 70 years of the chemical industry where it's the flame retardants in our sheets, in our blankets, it's the varnishes in our wood furniture, it's the formaldehyde in the press board cabinets in the kitchen and the bathrooms, if it's not solid wood, if it's press board, it's soaked in formaldehyde that outgasses into the air. Now there's no evidence that the amount of formaldehyde that leaches out of press board is toxic to humans. That's how they got away with this. It was the Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976, which is still the regulating guidelines at the federal level for introducing new chemicals into our environment. And the senators got paid off because there was a big scream at the time that they just ignored because the guidelines that well, you have to show that the amount of phthalates that leach into, nail into the bloodstream from nail polish are toxic. Well, that's reasonable, isn't it, Senator? Here, here's, here's three, $300,000 for your campaign. Isn't that reasonable, Senator? Well, that seems reasonable to me. If it's not toxic, what's the problem, right? And so we now, all of us humans, are this experimental lab of chemical accumulation. You know, you don't get more fat cells after the age of two or three. They just get bigger and smaller. Well, bigger with what? The toxins that you're exposed to, they're the storage depot areas when your brain says, get this off the highway, get it out of the bloodstream. It goes into storage. And that is why the primary reason why multiple sclerosis is going up, rheumatoid arthritis is going up, uh, celiac is going up, scleroderma is going up, lupus is going up. It just depends on your gene as to which gene is gonna get ramped up from the inflammation. Remember I said environmental triggers is what's also inside of you. And all of these toxic chemicals inside of you leach a little bit into the bloodstream. And so you get a little more inflammation every day. And that inflammation activates the gene, your genetic vulnerability. Here comes MS. Okay. So this so is what one, one more thing. This is PhD level concepts. But our doctors have been ignoring these studies that talk about this for years. So I'm coming to everyone that I can to say, hey, just read about this. Just read my books, read my books. And just, and here's all the studies and here's where they came from. And this is what they said. And when you read, they say, well, this makes sense. You mean I have to change my lifestyle? You mean my lifestyle is causing my problem? Well, I guess, yeah, that, okay, that makes sense. This five pillar thing, five pillars in the development of chronic inflammatory diseases, nine of the top, top 10 causes of death are chronic inflammatory diseases. So it makes sense that I probably will function better if I learn more about this. Okay, so what I'd like to do is to help everyone understand, you know, where can they get this information? Because after I heard you, I jumped on Google <laughs> and I had started researching and, and I started um, making decisions for myself. Like I, you know, I said that um, I have osteopenia. That's how I connected with you and Margie. 
And the doctor had wanted to put me on um, an injection, you know, to strengthen my bones. And then I read that what it did is it stopped the breakdown of the bone. (laughs) It stopped a function in my body. And you could only be on it at most three to six years. And and I thought I am, I'm not in and, and the side effect could be that my femur would break or my jaw would um, bone dense, my bone would break down in my jaw. And I'm thinking that's the last thing I need. And so that's why when I heard you speak about this idea of I can actually use food, correct? Yes. And, and then, you know, the environmental, other environmental factors. So that's why I stopped the wheat. Although yesterday I did have einkorn. <laughs> Wait, I wanted to try it and see, but I haven't had any since January 9. Um, well, well, I, wait, 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 no, no pass, no pass. So no pass. I, oh, no. Right, so I'm no wondering, pass. did I ruin, you know, everything right. I've done for the last two months? I can't let that go for the people out there who are listening. So here's what happens. When you've cleaned up your act and the immune system calms down, wheat is the one food that the science is very, very clear. You can't can't put your toe in the water a little bit because wheat creates something called memory B cells the immune system creates memory B cells to wheat. What what does that mean? When you get a vaccination, if if you're going to Africa, you need vaccinations months and months and months in advance for yellow fever and dengue fever and these weird diseases that you haven't heard of, but you need these vaccinations in advance. What happens, so you get a vaccination for yellow fever, the brain says, whoa, what's, what's that stuff that just got injected into me? You general, and in your immune system, you've got Army, Air Force, Marine Corps generals sitting around with nothing to do. General, you now are general yellow fever. Take care of this. General fever, general yellow fever makes an assembly line. He builds an assembly line to produce soldiers or special forces, and they're trained to go after yellow fever in the bloodstream, the injection you got. So they get out into the bloodstream and they're looking for yellow fever bug anywhere they find it. And they fire their chemical bullet to go after it. And that takes a few months to build up those assembly lines. That's why uh, you need these vaccinations months in advance before you go, because it takes a while to build up that protection. But if you go back to Africa 15 years later, you just need a booster shot two weeks before you go. Everybody knows about booster shots. Well, it's because you just have to wake up general yellow fever. General yellow fever is vigilant the rest of his life. That's his job. Uh, After you got the vaccination, everything calms down. Uh, You don't have antibodies to yellow fever in your bloodstream today if you got the vaccination uh, two years ago. But general yellow fever is there watching out. And anytime... If you get on an airplane and the guy behind you from Africa coughs and yellow fever bug comes in the air and you inhale it, general yellow fever just has to flip the switch. He doesn't have to build the assembly line again. That's why, that's what a booster shot is. Let's turn the assembly line back on. You don't have to build it. It's already built. Wheat is the only food that I have found study after study after study on memory B cells. Memory B cells are general yellow fever. They're called a memory B cell. So when you expose yourself to wheat, general wheat activates immediately, flips the switch. Now you start making the antibodies again to wheat, and you can't feel that when that's going on. Now you're you're not eating wheat anymore, but the, the assembly line stays on for a couple of months, making those antibodies. And those antibodies can trigger your genetic vulnerability to osteoporosis. So here come the antibodies to your bone cells, the autoimmune mechanism for your bone cells. So you can't, you can't be a little pregnant. You can't have a little wheat. Wow. Once you've crossed that line of tolerance, you just can't do it or else you're very likely to pay a price that you can't feel but it causes that damage for months and months. So 
The assembly line is on for about two months, about, about two months. Now, the antibodies you make have a lifespan of four to six weeks, usually, right? So, okay, two months, but the antibodies you made here just before the assembly line turned off, they've got a lifespan of four to six weeks, maybe four to eight weeks. So now you're four months out turning up the dimmer switch of your genetic vulnerability to chronic inflammatory diseases from a single exposure. Mm. Wow. Well, that's pretty depressing. It is. That's why you have to learn this stuff. You have to learn it. You have to get good at it. You can't put your toe in the water and learn a little bit. You really need to understand where are my vulnerabilities as an individual? Is it weed? Is it eggs? Um, is it mold? What are the triggers for the inflammation I currently have in my body? So you how do we to, find that out? Because our doctor's not going to do it. You know, Your doctors don't know that. Most doctors, the, the, the functional medicine doctors do. They're trained on this. But you, you find this out by reading my books. So which book that I mentioned earlier, the one on autoimmune? The, Is that the book we could read? The, the autoimmune fix, how to stop the hidden autoimmune damage that keeps you sick, fat, and tired before it turns into disease. <laughs> now you understand a little more of what that title means. Yes. Before it turns into disease, right? That's the book that talks about these mechanisms. The follow-up book, You Can Fix Your Brain, is two years later, and it talks about the similar mechanisms, but really focusing on how it affects your brain. And all of the tips in there that we talk about are the same tips that you would use with rheumatoid for your joints. In other words, here's three URLs for glass storage containers. Miles Kimball, Amazon, and whatever the third one is. And you go over here, you look, you, oh, I like those. And you order three round ones, two square ones, and one for the pie. And you pay with a credit card, you hit send. It took an hour to do that. But never again will you poison your family with leftover foods unknowingly. You were poisoning your family because the plastic storage containers, you give them to your husband to store nails out in the garage. But now, now you have glass storage containers. That's why the subtitle to the second book is uh, so the, the, the title of the book is You Can Fix Your Brain. The subtitle is Just One Hour a Week to the Best Memory, Productivity, and Sleep You've Ever Had. That is the only way to be successful in addressing the five pillars it, because it's so overwhelming that you allocate one hour a week. First week, glass storage containers, maybe. Second week, nail polish. You're going to go to the URL for the organic phthalate free nail polishes, you know, in, in the book. Next week, air, air, air quality in the house. And you're going to learn about um, NASA published the studies. Two six inch house plants in a 10 by 10 room absorbs over 70% of the toxic chemicals in the air because their astronauts were getting poisoned living in those containers in space that's all plastic and metal. And, and outgassing all these toxic chemicals. So a couple of little house plants do the job. Matter of fact, you, you go to my website, the dr.com, the doctor.com, just don't spell the word doctor out, the dr.com forward slash plants and download the handout. Uh, here are the plants that NASA says are great for you. And for people that, oh, I don't have a green thumb, they'll eventually die. Then you'll buy more. But in the meantime, you put two house plants in every room to absorb these toxins that are here from the building materials that you didn't know are toxic to you and your family. But now you know there's something about this. Well, that's exciting because, you know, those are, I've done the glass, I've got the plants, I'm so excited. Um, I know that on your website, you have some, some tests that we can get, the wheat zoomer. I don't know that, you know, I have a, an allergy, but now you're saying, you know, we pretty much damages the, the lining on everyone. But um, what are some tests we can go to at the doctor, dr.com? Um, what are yeah. some of the tests that we can get? Because we want some, you know, some solutions here. So we have the two books. Absolutely. That's easy. We all love, you know, books and and we can get them on Kindle, I'm sure, or yes. in print and even um, Audible. I actually did the audible for the second book. 
And it was the most difficult thing I'd ever done <laughs> because yeah. it's eight hours a day for four days uh, where every sentence, you know, you can't think about lunch and you know, I'm hungry because you know, you're reading out loud and you have to just focus your brain. Mm. Uh, so I, I did the audible for the second book. and I'm really proud of that. Uh, yes, it's on audible and Good. it's on Kindle and all of that. Um, um, but start. for tests, we, I oh, said, tests. what tests right. can we go right. to? Because that would be very helpful. I mean, I had a toxicity test that said my glycosate and also parabens were like a danger level. And I'm like, oh my gosh, but I was eating a lot of wheat at the time and it's sprayed with glycosate before they harvest it. So yeah. that's why I immediately stopped it. But um, where that scared me, you know, so where can we come take these tests? Because I'm sure you have access to some. Yeah, first, first and most important is to learn about what tests would be beneficial to do. Mm -hmm. Then go to your doctor and ask them, can you order these tests for me? Because it's always better for the doctor to learn, right? And if they say no, and most of them will because they don't know these tests and they won't, but these are the most accurate. Mayo Clinic has published I've got five papers, there's probably more, five different papers on the technology that this laboratory uses, saying it's a new era in laboratory medicine. Here's an example. If, if I take this iPhone and I open it up and I just go to one button and I push one button here, I can tell you that the air quality level in Spiazzo, Italy right now is 51. That's warning. In Chicago, it's 60. In San Diego, it's 71. And yesterday was at 7.9, uh, uh, 79. Well, that was danger. And I can tell you in five seconds what the air quality is in any city in the world. And uh, this is an encyclopedia. And if I had told you 30 years ago, you know, I'm going to walk around with this little thing of kind of the size of my wallet in my back pocket. I can pull it out. I can tell you anything in the world you want to know in five seconds. You would have thought I'd been watching too much Star Trek. <laughs> that, you know, that it, it's not possible. Technology advances. And technology has advanced in the world of laboratory medicine the same way. And Mayo Clinic calls, calls this technology a new era in laboratory medicine, safe, accurate, like no tests ever before. And we all think that when you do a blood test, it's going to be accurate. And uh, this would be really interesting if anyone, because I've done this and many doctors that um, have trained with me have done this to my suggestion. When you draw blood, take two tubes instead of one in the same blood draw, label the second tube with a different name and send it off and order the same test from both tubes. The test results come back different because the sensitivity and the specificity, that's the geek term for accuracy, is low. These tests are from the 1980s, 1990s. They're, they were the best available in their day, but they're not that good. Whereas these tests called the zoomers, because you zoom in on the problem, are right on the money every time, 97 to 99%. And so the ones that we recommend for every person uh, who comes to us is the wheat zoomer because it also uh, 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 identifies leaky gut. It's the most accurate test out there in the world. You know, I travel the world. I teach doctors. Uh, I'm going to, where, where am I going? I'm going to Dublin and then London uh, in June. I'll be in Brazil in November. Uh, maybe in Italy uh, in July. I'm not sure yet on that one, but I, I travel and teach all over the world. And I always look at the laboratories that come to these doctors' conferences and they have booths there to show docs their services. And I'm always looking. There's nothing like the Zoomers anywhere in the world. So we always recommend the Wheat Zoomer and the Neural Zoomer Plus. There's a Neural Zoomer, but we recommend the Neural Zoomer Plus. It's the most accurate test of inflammation in your brain 
of any test I've ever seen. Mm. So we, we look for wheat, we look for leaky gut, and we look for the brain because the brain is the canary in the coal mine. It's the early warning. You got a problem mm -hmm. and your, your genes are being ramped up. Your genes of inflammation are being ramped up. You got a problem here. It may manifest as MS or as schizophrenia or as osteoporosis, but it's coming. Oh, that's so scary. Well, we, we're at the top of the hour and I know you and I could go another hour <laughs> because it's, there's so much more to learn. But I want to make sure people know how they can connect with you. And that those that are part of our community already know about your, um, your autoimmune, your, your, your movie, The Betrayal. And, and we're going to make that available to them. But you have to share, again, your website and then also um, the movie because it's a docu-series. And it looks like you interviewed the top functional medicine doctors in the world at some kind of a conference where they all were there. And so that, I mean, that film series was life-changing for me. I did it while I did my exercise in the morning on my bike. I watched Marvelous. each one. Good it made you. me work out for an hour <laughs> you know, and watch. <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. Uh, just to finish up on the test, we always recommend the doctor, go, go to your doctor for the test and they won't know what they are probably. And mm -hmm. may, maybe they'll research it not, but you, you always can order the test on my website uh, uh, if you want. Um, okay. So, um, yeah, thank you. Um, the website is the dr.com, the doctor.com. Just don't spell the word doctor out. And my wife and I traveled to seven different countries and we interviewed the world leaders. I mentioned Professor Schoenfeld in Israel uh, and um, uh, we interviewed him and a wonderful man and many others. And then I interviewed doctors who were using these principles that the scientists were talking about. Now, when I inter in interviewed the scientists, I knew what to ask them because I'd read their research papers. So, you know, I didn't say, well, how did you get into this world? You know, all that boring, not necessary. I said, so professor, when you talk about vaccinations and the molecular mimicry of vaccinations, what are you referring to? I mean, I just go boom, like this. And then we took all of that information. And then we took the doctors who were applying these principles in their practice, we interviewed them. And then we asked them to bring in three or four of their patients who had followed these guidelines and uh, so we could interview them. And so, you know, I'll never forget the 40 year old woman, 44 year old woman in London. And uh, uh, she said, you know, I took the tube to come here today. That's the underground train. And she said, it's a seven block walk from the train station to here. And I walked and she said, it's not a big deal. And then she paused and she got teary eyed and said, but it is. And then we show you the picture of her in a wheelchair two years ago. She can't walk at all. And her MRI is seven lesions on her brain. And here she is today with no symptoms whatsoever and two lesions left on her brain, reversing the lesions in the brain. Was that a, MS? I'm sorry? Was that MS? Yes, it was MS. That's like my, my client was saying, that's what she had and they're gone. Yes. Yes. So good. And, okay. Wow. And, and, and uh, neurologists don't know about this. They just don't, they don't know. And it sounds like voodoo when someone says, well, the lesions on the brain are gone. Well, that sounds like voodoo. That guy doesn't know what he's talking about because it's unheard of in traditional medicine, but your body, Mrs. Patient, you have an entire new body every seven years, every cell in your body regenerates. Every doctor knows that every cell regenerates. So the question is, are you regenerating another sick, cell or are you regenerating a little healthier cell? When you change the environment inside by turning down the dimmer switches of inflammation, your body always wants to produce healthy cells as best it can. And so you get a little bit healthier, a little bit healthier, a little bit healthier until six months down the road, you go to church and you see someone you haven't seen and wow, what happened to you? You look so great. Say, well, you know, I watched this thing called betrayal and I changed my diet. I'm gluten free, dairy free, added sugar free. Uh, I've, I've got house plants in my rooms and now and I, I'm conscious of the toxic stuff that we were using, the toxic household cleaners. And I've changed all that out. We've got non-toxic stuff now. 
and you know, and, and, and the list goes on and on because you spend one hour a week doing this okay. because it's too overwhelming to try to do it all at once. Then if there's the last point I can leave people with is to be kind to yourself, be patient and allow yourself a learning curve that it's going to take time to learn this. And everybody wants it now. I want it now. It's if I tell you, look, your rheumatoid arthritis is going to take six months to a year but likely your pain will be down by 90% or more. Mm -hmm. Are you willing to do that? No, I want it now. Okay, go back out, find some different meds. And in a year when you're sicker, come on back and then, then we'll work with you. Right? Right. And that's what I, I get from all my doctors. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> like on the bone, when the bones, you know, bone density is bad enough, then we'll do this. Exactly. Right. Okay. And I don't want that anymore. So, so the movie is Betrayal. And I know it's a nine part docuseries. It was fantastic. I learned so much. I had to keep a notepad behind me. <laughs> so I could turn around and write notes because I was high up on the high boy. And so if they come to the doctor.com, they can um, actually subscribe and it's actually free. They can it's watch free. it for free. Yeah. It's all yeah. free. It's, it's at the, the dr.com forward slash betrayal. Yes. Okay. Perfect. And for all of, so I, so I want to thank you for being here. It has been amazing. You have changed my life and I know you've changed so many lives of so many people. And I'm sharing this as, with as many people as I can. Thank you, Katana, for what you're doing. It's such a great service you're offering. And for all of you out there, make sure you let Katana know that you appreciate because she's not getting paid for this, right? <laughs> right? And, no. and it's, it's, it's her act of love to give back to the community. Yes, yes. So thank you for being here. And I want to thank all of our guests for being here. And if you want to be on our list, so you know who's going to be on the show and you can have access to their articles and their websites and all the free gifts, because if you're in our list, then you're getting a link to the movie Betrayal. Then be sure to come to joinsmartwomen.com and you'll become a free member of our community and get access to all the gifts. So until our next show, Go out and live with more purpose, passion, and prosperity. Smart Women Talk is brought to you by Smart Women's Empowerment, a 501c3 nonprofit project of United Charitable. Music by Bill Lucas from his album, When It Rains. Available on Apple, Music, and Spotify. Catch us wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. And be sure to join our free community, at joinsmartwomen.com to access all our free Smart Women resources.